Thank you. Heavenly Father, awesome God, bowing before you. Today, I want to take this, this class on a journey that I have not been with them on. It's a journey through some words, tying some scriptures together that tell us, Lord, that no matter what happens in this world, you're in control. That no matter what happens come November, you're in control, Lord. No matter what happens in a world that is truly chaotic, you are in control. You are sitting on the throne. You are at the controls, and nothing will happen that you don't allow. And so, Father, therefore, we can get over our disgust. We can get over our depressions. We can get over that this didn't go my way or that didn't go my way in life and know that if you're in control, that you are going to bring good out of it for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. That's what your word says. We're going to claim it, Lord, and we're going to live on it, and we're going to stand on it, even when it's hard. And so, Father, in this passage of Scripture today and the ones that we'll tie together, would you just help us to see what you have got in store for your people, but also for this world. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. All right. I really hope you have your Bibles in front of you today. Uh, if you don't, take out your phones and go to your, don't call your neighbors or friends, okay? But get on the app, your Bible apps. I know a lot of you go that route today. And, uh, my, I missed a call. But anyway, I'll get back to Dawn later. I'll call you in a little while, Dawn. But anyway... Something must be wrong up here. She's trying to get me. Okay, but get your Bibles out because I want you to really, truly go through this scripture today. If you don't have either, and I've guilted you enough, your sermon notes, write this scripture down because I want you to go back to it because we're going to tie some scripture together, as I said in the prayer, in a way that I've not done in the 30 years of my ministry, okay? But Hebrews leads us to this point, and it's a wonderful thing about this Hebrews as we get to uh, this part in the end of chapter 12, it is amazing what this tells me. And I was going over the notes this past week, and I just came with regards to God's timing may not be my timing, but God's timing is perfect timing, all right? God's timing is always perfect, even though it's not on my schedule. And it just proves it all over again as we come to this passage, and especially when we come to what's going on with this nation today where we're going as a people, and where we should be going as the church of God, all right? Uh, as I read through this passage, I couldn't help but think about the times we're living in. This past week, Dawn and Lauren and I attended at Central Baptist Church in, in Kannapolis a, a conference on values and faith, and they had several folks. The Benham brothers were there to speak. There were several others. But one guy I heard for the first time, his name is Bishop, well, his title's Bishop, but his name's E.W. Jackson. And I don't know if you saw or heard anything about E.W. Jackson during the last campaign four years ago, uh, but he ran for the lieutenant governor of Virginia. He's a pastor, but he's also a politician. Believe it or not, it, that can go together. Uh, you know, in fact, a lot of the signers of the Declaration of Independence proved that point. All right? So uh, he speaks on values and morals in this country. But he said, uh, he had a statement that really got my attention, especially for you history buffs. I want you to listen to this. He said this, that America today is more divided than it ever has been. And, of course, you know what I'm thinking. Here is a black man standing there, and he doesn't remember segregation, or he doesn't think about civil war and all that went on back then. But then he went on to say this. He said, America is more divided than it ever has been, even more so than at the time of the Civil War. Now, that got my attention when he said this. Not only is he a black man, he's an activist, he's the grandson of slaves, and he gave us a little bit of his testimony along the way. But he said, today America is more divided than even at the time of the Civil War. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was a time when brother went against. Brother, are you, are, come on, think about that for a second. But then he put it into context. He said, even during the Civil War, both sides of the nation bowed to the same God. He said, even during the Civil War, the majority, the vast majority of the population read the same Bible. They may have interpreted it differently for their cause, which led them to think like they did and led to the division then. But he said, at least we came together in the same way, spiritually speaking. 
He said, today we can't even agree on who's, who, what's the right God, who's the right faith, what's the right faith, which religion is right, are all religions right? He said, we're a divided nation over many things. And I went on to think about that, and I said, you know, spiritually speaking, he's right. He's right. Because guess what? In 1860, 1865, when you got married, you knew it was between man and woman. There wasn't any other. There wasn't any question about who it was, who, who were you going to marry? Going to be a man or a woman? When there was life in the womb, life in the womb was sacred at every point, at every stage. We are divided nations when it comes to a connection because guess what? In that time, you could stand up and they didn't have the song, God Bless America, but you could stand up and pray and you could stand up and call on Jesus anytime, anywhere, even in the halls of government. And nobody got offended, nobody said anything, even though we were still a nation of different religions at that point. But church, we're living in uncertain times, divided times. The writer of Hebrews comes to this, and the reason I say God's timing is so perfect is the writer of Hebrews has a term for it too. He calls them shaky times, shaky times. And in such times, he says, in shaky times, we need to listen all the more closely to what God is saying to us. I want you to see this in Hebrews 12. Then we are going many places in the next few minutes. So Hebrews 12, verse 25, it says this. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? What in the world is this talking about? Well, let me fill you in. How many of you here remember, this was a very important date in the life of First Reformed Church, March the 8th, 2015. Sunday, March the 8th, something happened very important in this place, March 8th, 2015. All right? year a little over a year and a half ago a year and a half ago we started that sunday on our hebrew study okay <laughs> and we are almost there we are on the last page in my bible okay before we pick up leviticus <laughs> okay i want you to turn back to hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and i want you to see something really neat here it, it, i tell you god puts things together his way and I'm just glad to be in on a little bit of it. Okay, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. We started on March 8, 2015 with these words. In the past, God spoke, remember, we've just read in verse 25, chapter 12, listen to his voice. Hebrews 1, 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son he has spoken to us by his son church i want you to know hebrews 1 verse 1 nullifies every other religion and faith out there that's not christian it calls it false for what it is because according to hebrews 1 verse 1 god chose one way to speak to us through jesus christ there is no other way. Buddha is not God's mouthpiece. Okay? Muhammad was not God's messenger. Joseph Smith was not God's voice. All right? Jesus Christ was God's word made flesh. John chapter 1. God's word made flesh that dwelt among us. And if anyone around you tells you that God has spoken to them and it contradicts what he says between these two covers... Call them the liar for what they are. Amen. Call them the liar for what they are lovingly, okay? <laughs> then let them know that what they have said cannot be backed up in Scripture. It just can't be. Not too many years ago, we left our denomination in December of 98. Many of you are around for that. A few months after that, it wasn't long after that, the denomination we are part of came up with a slogan that was plastered on billboards. It was plastered on bumper stickers. Uh, they, they preached about it. They taught about it. But it, it, here's, here's the saying. God is still speaking. That, that was the, and at first you hear that and that sounds just wonderful. And at first you hear that and you sound, say it's wonderful because, yeah, in many ways it's true. God is still speaking. Guess what? I opened this book up this week and he spoke to me over and over and over again. 
He still speaks through pastors and teachers and believers. He still speaks through you. But he speaks through the word. It's the word that encourages. It's the word that lifts you up. It's the word of hope that is living and breathing. And this is why this is not like any other book on your shelf. It's different. It's different. It's alive. But I've got news for those folks who say God is still speaking because they, what they mean is a little bit different. What they mean is God is still evolving. He's changing so that his word will fit our times. All right? He's changing so that what, what may have appeared wrong back then is no longer wrong now because we have evolved. We've gotten enlightened. We have grown. We're educated folks now. And so God has changed that voice, that word again. Let me tell you up front and very clearly, and this, these are not words that I've held back because I have shared them with some of the folks in our former denomination as well. Yes, God is still speaking, but he is not speaking anything that's not found in this word. Amen. Okay? Not anything. Right is still right in God's eyes. Wrong is still wrong in God's eyes. He's not changing his view to fit your and my likes and dislikes, okay? So when God truly speaks, the writer says in verse 25, listen. Listen to what he has to say. And then he goes back to the Exodus when the Israelites were camped at the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses is up on the mountain. And you remember what we talked about last week, that the place looks, Mount Sinai looks like a fiery furnace. I mean, it was frightening just to look. It's almost a Halloween picture to look at, all right? There is a, a dark cloud that surrounds it. There are sounds coming. I mean, the whole place is shaking as well. And when God's voice speaks, the people are terrified. Remember when we said last week that they got so, so scared that when Moses came down the, from the mountain the first time, they said to him in Exodus 20, verse 19, Speak to us yourself. You know, Moses... You talk to us and we'll listen. But don't have God speak to us or we'll what? We're going to die if we hear that again. I mean, we're in the presence of his power and his majesty and his strength. We're going to die if we hear that. They didn't want to hear God's voice literally. Well, let me tell you, they didn't want to hear God's voice spiritually either. They were down there while Moses is up there the second time around taking on the commandments. And what are they doing? They're collecting all the, the gold teeth and the earrings and everything they can collect. And they're making a golden cow. All right? And it's over and over and over the people didn't want to hear God. They just walked away from him over and over and over again. And so he says here, he says here, when Jesus came on the cross, that's what he's getting to in verse 25 and following. When Jesus came on the cross, through his sacrifice, God did speak again. He spoke that ultimate and that final and that greatest way. And just like back in the old days, people are still turning away from God's voice. And so he says, listen, I have no doubt in this room right now with a number of people, there is someone turning away from God. You're here, you're sitting here because you did it because you're with family or you wandered in and you wanted to hear some music or whatever reason. <laughs> or maybe you sat in a pew and you thought because you were baptized as an infant years ago that you are automatically a believer in Jesus Christ. Just because you have your name on a roll, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Just because your grandparents drug you to church, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But I got news for you. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are still just as good as not listening to this voice and turning away and walking away and rejecting him. All right. All right. So here's what he says, and I want you to see this. Some of you have been in debate classes, and you'll know where he's going with this. He says, if God judged those who wouldn't listen to him back in those Old Testament times, do you really think he's going to look the other way when we reject him today? Debate class. This is an argument from lesser to greater, from lesser to greater. What he's saying is, if people refused God when he spoke the way he did on Mount Sinai years ago, and he judged them for it, and now God has given you a greater word through Jesus Christ dying on the cross, if you turn away, do you really think you can get away with it? Do you don't think he's going to judge you too? And even more strongly, because you, and of course the answer is yes, he's going to judge because we have the greater word. If it's one thing the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us, it's this. If you're walking around here with a casual acquaintance with Jesus Christ, you better wake up. You better listen to his voice and you better get real. Don't take that relationship lightly. Don't take it casual. Realize he, when he calls, you're to respond, okay? 
Because here's what's going to take place in the near future. I want you to look at these next two verses. Verses 26 and following. At that time, his voice shook the earth. Mount Sinai, he shook the earth. But now he has promised, once, once more, I'm going to shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. All right. Here, some of you are real prophecy fanatics. You love prophecy. Well, here's the writer of Hebrews, and I love Hebrews. Here's where he goes into prophecy for you, okay? Last week, we looked at what the finish line in the faith race looks like. When you get to heaven, what's this Mount Zion going to look like? What's this new Jerusalem going to look like? You guys at the beach, you just missed a fantastic service last week. And we got out at 4 to 12. But anyway, we won't go over that. Ain't going to happen today. But anyway, and so what we talked about was how beautiful heaven is and what's to come and what you're going to be a part of. What he does today is he says, okay, I want to set you believers apart. Right, You, you sit over here for a second. Now I want to talk to you people who have a casual acquaintance with Jesus Christ. Those who claim to be believers, but you're not. Those who call me Lord, Lord, and one day I'm going to say, depart from me, I don't know you. Those who have walked away and turned away, and I want, you, I want to tell you what you have in store. What you have in store and what this world has in store. John Piper, great Baptist preacher, John Piper calls this the final, or the great final shaking. That's his term for it, the great final shaking. You know me, I came up with a better term. I call it shake and bake. Because, and I am not being facetious and I am not being light on this, you know. Uh, what's that I was saying? Uh, it's sanctified or chicken fried. Well, that's basically, that's, that's basically what's coming here. And I want to show you, I'm not making this up. This is truly shake or bake. What the writer's talking about here are the last days of the world, of the world, of creation as we know it. Church, there is coming a moment. When God brings everything you can physically touch, you can physically see, every building on earth, every, in fact, look up in the heavens, the sun, the stars, the moon, all of that to an end. There is coming that moment when everything crumbles and burns up. And he begins to paint this picture by reminding them of the moment when God was on Mount Sinai and they heard the quaking and they saw the fire and it shook. And just as the earth responded, creation responded to God's voice then, he's saying creation's getting ready to respond all over again. And the earth and the universe will take note. In fact, he says many times, the earth and the universe, even the trees and the rocks, they're going to bow down where people won't. Even they'll recognize who he is. The words here actually come from prophecy, Okay. In Haggai chapter 2 verse 6, God said this, In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. All right? Okay, class, I want to take you through a little bit of Scripture and tie some things together. Scripture you've heard in bits and pieces maybe, but let's tie this together. Isaiah affirms this prophecy in uh, Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 13 verse 13. He said this, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his, what? Burning anger. His burning anger. Now, let's jump from Old Testament all the way to the last book in the New Testament. Last book of the Bible. We're going to uh, Revelation chapter 16. All right, I mean, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6. Now I want you to see this from John's perspective as he's given these words from the Holy Spirit. Revelation 6, and I'm trying to find, it is the last book, right? It's not the index. Revelation 6, verses 17 and following. It says this. All right, I'm sorry, verse 12 and following. Yeah, verse 12 through 17. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great what? Okay, earthquake. Sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. Something's happening in the skies as well. The whole moon turned blood red. Stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide from us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? All right, let me sort of walk you through this for a second. What's happening here? 
What's happening here are those folks who did not listen to his voice. And all of a sudden, the earth starts to shake, the heavens start doing their thing, and people wise up and they say, where can I run? Where can I run? And all those who have turned away from God try to hide because the last place they want to be, this scripture is saying, is in the presence of Almighty God. The last place. And so they are willing to run to the mountains and the caves even when those are falling apart. Okay, that's what's happening in this. Now that I've got a serious face on each and every one of you, let's put some more here together. Revelation chapter 16. Verses 17 and following says this, And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. And then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great spirit city split into three parts and the city of the nation collapsed God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine and the fury of his wrath interesting thing about this scripture the great city Jerusalem splits in three sections when we were over there several years ago I'll never forget being on the Mount of Olives and looking over across the Kidron Valley over to the um, to the Temple Mount and our our Jewish guide, our Messianic Jewish guide said, I want you to know this is where Jesus returns. This is where he comes down on the Mount of Olives when he returns. And in that moment, in that moment, she says, there is going to be, as Scripture says in Revelation 16, that great earthquake that splits this city apart. And she said, I want to tell you something interesting, not from a religious standpoint, but did you know one of the greatest fault lines in all the earth, bigger than the San Andreas Fault in California, is sitting, you're standing right on it, on the Mount of Olives, and it runs right through Jerusalem. So you don't think God has things planned? You don't think he has things worked in his timing for things to occur when they, you get the picture? One day, God is going to destroy this world and the universe around us. And as Scripture goes on to say, He's going to replace it with a new heaven and a new earth. I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter 21. And look at these words. Then I saw a new heaven, verse 1. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And this is Scripture I didn't give to Sam to put on slides, so don't worry. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now that's what's happening. This new city, this new heaven, this new universe, this whole new thing is going to be prepared for us. Now, I want you to go back, if you would, between Hebrews and Revelation, there's a book called 2 Peter. It's a little, little book. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, and I want you to see that I'm not making this up with what's going to go, go on with this world. Chapter 3, verse 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We heard that from Jesus, right? The heavens will disappear with a roar. Everything you see is going to be gone. Uh, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. It's amazing. You go out, and you who have vacationed, and you've seen the beautiful national parks, or you've gone, so we, we have, uh, Derek is leaving for, uh, Derek White's leaving for Sweden tomorrow morning. We have some other folks who are heading overseas soon. And you see all these beautiful places, and you think they're there forever. No, they're not. No, they're not. Even the ocean you fly over is not there forever. It's not there forever. You remember one day the disciples were walking with Jesus around the temple. And they looked at this was right before the crucifixion. They look up at the temple and it's so beautiful and it's so stately and it's so permanent looking. And they said nothing basically they're saying nothing could destroy this. It is here forever. It is so beautiful. It's so glorious. (laughs) And Jesus just looks at him and says before you die basically every stone you see will be turned over. Every stone you see. And it wasn't but 40 years after Jesus died that the Romans came in and the temple was knocked down and it came true. So if he said that back then and he says this now, do I think it's going to come true? Yeah, I do. It's going to come true. The only thing that will remain, let me put a smile on your face, believer. The only thing that is unshakable is the kingdom of God. And here's the good news. 
If you have said yes to Jesus Christ and invited him into your life, you have a personal relationship with him that's real, you are a part of the kingdom. You are unshakable. You are unshakable. Now, does that mean we will endure some stuff? Yes. Does it mean we're enduring stuff? Yes. But church, it's you and me who are part of the kingdom. And the warning here is for those who have turned away from the kingdom. When Jesus died on that cross, God spoke once again. And the writer says, don't refuse the voice. Don't turn away and reject the very gift that God has offered. Because when the world is destroyed, there's going to be another great shaking. After the earthquake, there's another great shaking before that great white throne. Because in that place will be millions upon millions, countless numbers from every nation, from every tribe. Everyone who has bowed the knee voluntarily, or they're bowing the knee now because they have to. But they're going to be standing there. And in that day, Jesus is going to look out from his throne and say, You know what? You call me Lord. I don't know you depart from me there's going to be a shaking you know what the shaking is going to separate it's not going to crumble the world shaking is going to separate lambs from goats sheep from the goat in that time now folks as we've said before we're living in chaotic and divisive times we know that but understand this nothing is going to happen in this country nothing is going to happen in this world and nothing is going to happen in your life that God does not allow for some purpose. For some purpose, even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. I got news for you. Election day may not go as you like it. Somebody has said we're moving trick-or-treat time to November 8th or 9th or whatever that day is. Uh, yeah, it's going to be trick-or-treat, all right. But I want you to know. Whoever sits on that throne in Washington, D.C., come next January 21st or whatever, whoever it is, God has allowed that to happen. Don't, now, I'm not saying don't do your part and just sit around and don't vote and all this. I'm not saying that at all. You do your part, okay? But God has allowed it so that his plan can be carried out and not David's. His plan and not yours. You see, because he's seeing the whole puzzle put together, you're seeing bits and pieces. You and I are seeing bits and pieces. A lot of the mess we're seeing right now are the labor pains. That's what Jesus called them. Taking place, if you would, before the main event. All right? Uh, this is what Jesus, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll close this thing out pretty soon. Another half hour or so. But anyway, Matthew 24. Hey, I didn't have breakfast either. I'm looking forward to lunch. Okay. Uh, but this is too good. Matthew 24, you can tell I'm old school. <laughs> All right. Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8 say this. Remember the disciples, they say, Lord, give us a time. Show us when's the end of the age. And he says this, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. <laughs> How can we be not alarmed? Come on, Lord. Uh, you know what he means. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, I, you know, birth pains, that doesn't sound like something fun, right? I can remember when our first one was being born, and we are there in the middle of the night, and it's cold room, and I'm sitting over there on this couch, and, and Dawn's laying over there in bed, and Lauren hasn't been born yet. It's hours away, but the contractions are getting heavier and, 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 more, and closer together. And I, I'm over there. I'm over there watching the little machine. Back in those, it looked like a ticker tape machine. And, you know, they had a little ticker tape, and they had the thing going up and down, and whenever it would be a really good contraction, it would go, you know, it's like that. And Dawn's over there suffering in pain every time that thing goes over. And I'm over there looking at the thing saying, yes, yes, you got another one. Yeah. Go, go, Dawn, go. And she's over there, would you get out of my room, please? <laughs> you know. But here's the deal, guys. It's as if this world is hooked up to that machine right now. And every once in a while, something racks our world and the the needle just goes zzz, 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 and it's like birth pains that's what Jesus was saying it's like birth pains before the main event but there's a reason he's bringing us through this there's a reason 
because there is someone else who has not come to him that he's waiting for them to turn and come back. There's someone who hasn't heard his voice who he's saying, I'm going to wait and hold out for the very, very last second because I know this one's going to turn to me. From the foundation of time, I've known this one is going to turn to me and going to come back. And so he is waiting and he's taking us through these chaotic times for number one, to bring souls into the family. Number two, to usher in the kingdom of God. It's as if he's giving us these warning signs so that people will hear his voice and let go of some of the things they're holding so closely to. Let go of the things that we're looking at and saying, this is going to be around forever. No, it's not. No, it's not. So you can take hold of those things that will be around forever. The kingdom of God. And this is the gift he wants to present to us. The gift of the kingdom of God. These last two verses, let me just read them. Therefore, since we are, Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. For our God is a consuming fire fire a consuming fire we talked about running the faith race and coming to the finish line and receiving the prize well folks as a participant in this race it says you are already receiving that kingdom that's what we just read you are already receiving that kingdom as believers you have already received the kingdom that can't be shaken paul said it in romans 8 so therefore nothing can separate you from the love of god found in christ jesus your lord Nothing can separate you. No amount of shaking that goes on is going to tear apart your relationship to Jesus Christ. Church, the kingdom of God is yours right now. And when the time comes for this great shaking to destroy the earth, you and I don't have to worry about being destroyed with it. Now, will we go through some of the birth pains? You bet we will. We might have to face some of the persecution. The insults, the hardship that comes along with running this race and standing firm for Jesus Christ. We might have to endure some, of the, endure some of the chaos. But when the great shaking comes and the earth is finally destroyed, where you are, be, you'll be going, you ain't going to be shaking. It's going to be smooth water. It's going to be smooth water. Neither will there be, this is good, neither will there be death, nor mourning, nor crying nor pain for the old order of things has passed away amen hallelujah so the question this morning is pretty simple wrap it up right here are you listening to the voice of the one who loves you so much that he sent his one and only son so that if you will just believe you will not perish but you'll have eternal life are you listening to him or are you one in this room who's still walking away are you holding on to an unshakable God and you, are you a part of an unshakable kingdom? Or are you trusting in things like possessions and careers and fame and fortune and your good name and everything else that will be shaken from your hands and lost forever one day? Okay, church. I hope that you see clearly that je this Jesus we follow is truly everything. That will, that's what we entitled the, uh, I entitled the, 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 the sermon series on Hebrews. Jesus is everything. And what this passage shows me is that Jesus is not just the giver of grace. He's the all-consuming fire. He's the giver of grace to give you pardon and mercy. But he's that all-consuming fire that will look at David Franks and say, David, this is sin in your life and it's wrong. Change. Change. He is the lamb who was slain, tender lamb that was slain, but he's also the lion of Judah that could take you out in a heartbeat. He's the suffering servant, servant washing your feet and dying in your place, but he's the judge on the throne calling sin, sin, and dispensing justice. You see, you can't have one part without the other. That's what I want to tell those folks we left years ago. You can't have the part that said, he who is without sin cast the first stone without also having the part of this is sin, go and sin no more. Both. It's not an either or. You can't have part of this word that suits you and lifts you up and makes you comfortable and throw out everything else. 
you've also got to take the part that convicts you and cause you to change and hurts every once in a while because it's discipline. And by all means, you cannot, you cannot redefine God so that He is saying what you want Him to say and speaking when you want Him to speak. You can't do it. You can only respond to Him in faith and go where He wants you to go. And I promise you, if you do that, if you give up your own way for His, you'll have smooth waters ahead. You'll have a peaceful valley where someone will walk with you. And when it is rough, you'll have someone right there with you. You see, if you do anything less, church, if you do anything less, you are not any better than those in chapter 12, verse 25, who refuse to listen to his voice and turn away. So with Samuel of old, the next time you hear Jesus Christ speaking to you, let me give you some words, a response. Same words of Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And we will do nothing else. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, uh, the anthem, the choir sang a little while ago, those words. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Oh, yeah, Lord, that's me down to a T. Well, I can talk big in this place with a lot of people who agree with me. And I can sing the praise songs and I can be churchy. But Lord, it's so tough when you get out there and you're amongst others and you're the minority in the crowd and they don't think like you, talk like you, believe like you. And it's in those times, Lord, that hurt and are chaotic and divisive that we are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. Lord, we don't want it that way. We want to be strong in you. And so, Lord, in this place, today, as you truly, Spirit, move about this room, I know you're convicting. I know you're moving in the hearts of those who might be a little casual with you. Those who might wonder, do I really have a relationship with Jesus Christ or not? And, Lord, those words we said one day, one day our faith is going to be sight. One day the skies are going to be rolled back like a scroll. It's going to happen. It's really going to happen. And in that day, we want to be right. And so if there's anyone in this room who it is so time for them to simply cross that line and say yes to you, let it be now. Let it happen right now. Yeah, we got lunch to go to. We got plans to go to. We got afternoon to enjoy. But Lord, you got a soul to save in this place and in this world. You got people you want to see cross that line. And so Jesus in this place, could it happen right now? Would it happen right now? You move in the hearts of men and women so that it can. Young and older alike, I want to speak just directly. Head still bowed. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, called upon the name of the Lord, I want you to know you can do it right now. So would you simply say a prayer like this? Lord, I've heard all this talk and some of it scares me. I know what kind of culture we live in and it's hard. I, I don't know all the ins and outs. I don't know a lot of what the preacher was talking about. But Lord, I know enough to know I don't have a relationship with you. And I'd love one. I'd love everything that comes with it. So, Lord, in this place, would you come into my heart and come into my life? I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And in this place, if you pray a prayer like that in your own words, it's going to happen, my friend. And you're a fan, the part of the family of God. You become unshakable. Unshakable, even in shakable times.